It was the summer of 1997, and I was a grad student in Northern California from abroad. I wasn't an immigrant then, just a foreigner getting a degree and planning to go back to the old country afterwards. At the time, my girlfriend was still back home abroad, since we both expected me to return to Europe after graduation and, maybe, through unspoken words at the time, possibly get married after. So she came over for a summer vacation. Let's do a road trip to Southern California. Let's take the coastal highway down to South Cali. See Santa Barbara, Monterey, LA, Venice Beach, San Diego. Even drive down into Baja. The whole tourist enchilada for two twenty-somethings visiting oh-so-cool California. My then-girlfriend and this description of her physical features is entirely serving as preparation for what was to come that day. Had perfectly shaped thin legs and a curvy body, she had long hair and was generally speaking quite attractive. She was also borderline paranoid, which I already knew then, where she had dragged me into conflict where she demanded I defend her like a man when the situation had been completely provoked by her and it deteriorated due to her unstable, let's say, mental tendencies. Hence my tendency to not immediately jump on the thought of getting married. Frankly, I wasn't sure about the marriage part, but I knew that then, and I went along with her demands and plans as usual that day. We were in love and all that, but me perhaps a little less than her, so we did drive down to South Cali from the Bay Area, and eventually, my old rusty but beloved clunky 80s convertible, I cheaply required as an almost wreck in the Bay Area, took us along the beach road to a motel in San Diego. Let's pick a motel near the beach, she said, so we can step out and swim in the sea in the morning. Let's check in, get dinner somewhere, and drive around town to get the feel. Okay, what she wants goes. She pointed at a motel across the coastal road. There was one after another, but she knew what she wanted, so she chose. This is the one, she said. Let's park and see. The vacancy sign was lit. The parking spots in the motel courtyard were all but empty. I drove in and parked. I'd driven the whole day, and she could see I was tired. I'll drive later, she said sweetly. I was grateful. She goes to the motel counter while I unload our suitcases. Coming with the suitcases to the reception, she's talking to a youngish, tall, dark blonde guy behind the counter. Not too bad looking. He's looking her up and down with small eyes, clearly checking her out. Looks at me, then turns around, grabs a key from the board and says, I got the perfect room for you and he leads us to the outside stairs. The motel is just a chain of rooms lined up, all of them looking towards the ocean. The doors toward the motel parking lot courtyard. He takes us up to a room right smack in the middle of the long building. It was the second floor. The entire motel seems empty. I'm tired, but why this room, I wondered. Hauling the luggage, I thought to myself, why not downstairs, or at least one of the ends? The view is the same everywhere. As we enter, I notice one smaller door next to our motel room door, which says, Service Personnel Only. Our room is right next to it. It's built narrow, but has a big bed and a bathroom, and on the left wall, just across from the big bed, a giant mirror. On the wall of that service room, the guy nods and leaves us to it. As soon as we're alone in the room and he has left, I turn to my girlfriend and say, Don't you think this is weird? What? She says. I point at the mirror and take a closer look. Yeah, it's fixed into the wall. It's not one you can remove. I find this really creepy. Don't be paranoid, she says. Okay. Maybe. I have to get something out of the car, so I step outside, only to see Mr. Motel Man just stepping out of the service room, locking it behind himself, 
and heading downstairs. Once I was back up, I took a big textile blanket and hung it over the mirror. Maybe I am paranoid, or maybe I'm not. If he was a peeping Tom, he didn't get anything. We take a nap, and later, as we head out for some food and checking out town, and the night is drawing near, the motel parking lot is now two-thirds full. We were early. Good, my girlfriend says. I feel foolish and swear to myself to be less paranoid. She is usually paranoid enough for the both of us. That mirror, though. Never mind, I thought. So we spend the evening having dinner, driving around, until we finally decide it's time to go back to the motel. It's dark, and it's way before GPS is, so I consult the city map we have. I sit on the passenger seat, glad she's driving, while I try to read the map of San Diego in the light of a feeble, tiny keychain light. We're driving roughly back in the direction of the motel, somewhat parallel to the beach boulevard we need to be on, but I realize we might have gone too far. As I stare at the map in the dim light, she looks in the rearview mirror and suddenly says, that van there is following us. I look up. Surely she's being the paranoid one now. What? Behind us, one lane to the right, is an old silvery blue van, a bit run down with darkened windows. I swear, she says, He's been behind us for three blocks at least, and he's taken the same turns. He's not even trying to pass us, even when I drive slowly. I look around. There's hardly any traffic in the direction as we roll on. I seriously doubt her, my rational mind telling me that victims rarely ever get picked randomly. I try to calm her down, look at the map again, and get an idea. Look, I said. We actually have to take a U-turn left around to get down into the lane that takes us back towards the beach boulevard with the motel. So, I said, looking down the road at the next traffic light a block away. There's no cop here. Take an illegal U-turn at that next light. Then we'll see. She nods. I know she's a way better driver than me. She's had three more years driving experience with stick shift in narrow European streets while I just learned driving in California. As we approach the next traffic light and crossing, a clear, no U-turn sign hung next to the light. That eerie silver-blue van behind us to the right. The light turns red, and my girlfriend gone race car driver puts the pedal all the way down, motor howling, and shoots over the red line in an illegal U-turn around to get in the opposite direction. And the van, I kid you not, it sped up, shot into our lane behind us and did the same thing, wheels screeching on the pavement. Then it accelerates full throttle to catch up, being barely an arm's length behind our bumper, its lights glaring into our rearview mirror, blinding like hell. Hit it, hit it, I told her, now panicking myself. My girlfriend accelerates. The van behind us is staying on our tail. What now? We shoot down two, three blocks. The van right upon us. More cars join in our direction, though. Behind us, the traffic gets denser and the lanes merge into one. Now the van is still behind us, but close behind the van are three or four more cars, all speeding, all pretty close to each other. We can see their lights. We're back on the boulevard where our motel is. One lane road, many fairly close parked cars to our right, with just the occasional gap or entries to the other parking lots, a concrete barrier to the left. No room to go but forward. We're moving fairly fast, easily 60 miles per hour. We're for sure going way past the speed limit here, but so is everybody else. How do we shake this van? Surely we shouldn't lead them straight to the motel. My girlfriend's super driver suddenly hits the brakes and veers to the right. The van has no choice. It cannot break or it will get hit by the cars behind it. It passes us on the left, immediately followed by three, four, five more speeding cars tailing it, all fast in one lane, 
while my girlfriend swoops the car perfectly into what feels like a tiny pigeonhole of a parking spot. We can't stay here, I muttered after we come to a stop and catching my breath, totally stunned by her skills. I know, she says, and hits the pedal again, shooting out into the traffic. But now we're behind the van, safely at at least eight or nine cars behind it. They can't possibly know. Just 200 yards further down came our motel. She took a swing into the parking lot. We parked and rushed up into our motel room, the one with the creepy mirror. I looked back the whole time, wondering if anybody had seen us. But nothing, just a pleasant summer evening wind. I didn't sleep much that night, and neither did she. Just another tourist summer night in San Diego. I was driving home from work and decided I wanted a pizza. I pulled into a pizza shop near my home. It's a Saturday night and it's pretty busy. It's staffed by three young girls. When I say young girls, I'm talking like teenagers. I don't know how it is elsewhere in the world, but working at a pizza shop here in Australia is very much a get-paid-cash-after-school type of job. As I'm ordering, the girl taking the order is really distracted. She's looking past me at something. Then, as I'm trying to pay, she yells out to the other two girls prepping and cooking something like, Oh, thank God, Matt is back. As she said that, a delivery boy walked into the store, but pretty much came in and straight away did a 180 turn, taking more pizzas and leaving. I pay and turn to sit and wait. And that's when I see what the girl had been looking at behind me, standing next to the entry door, peering through the shop face window, is a visibly terrifying man. He was about five foot eight, in his late twenties or early thirties, rat-like, pudgy, unnaturally pale, with dark spots under his eyelids, long and greasy dark hair, and sharp-looking, almost cylindrical teeth. Weirdly, I thought, huh, maybe that's her friend. Obviously, I got bad vibes, but my initial reaction was just confusion at the sight of him. Anyway, another guy comes in to pick up some pizzas pretty much right as I sat down, and the girl freezes while serving him too, but this time she apologizes and says something like, Sorry, I'm a bit distracted because this guy won't stop coming to my work and staring at me through the window. My boss banned him, but he comes back when he's gone. I take a proper look at the window guy now, and he's like pointing at her and waving and making other weird gestures. This instantly made me very uncomfortable, so without really thinking, I went outside and confronted the guy about what he was doing. I had a fair bit of adrenaline and don't really remember what I said, but it was something along the lines of, you have to leave. You're scaring the workers. He just stared at me and did this weird wheeze in exasperation, like a dismissive wheeze. Then, through a wheezy voice, he said, I'm not doing anything. I said, You're being a creep and you're banned. Get out of here. Then I went back in. The creep walked off and I thought it was solved. The girl thanked me and asked what he said. I said he didn't really say anything, and she explained some stuff to the other guy before, and also said he had said some really inappropriate and gross things to her. Just as I'm sitting back down, the guy comes in with a blank card in his hand. I said, What did I just tell you? Get out of here. But he makes a beeline straight to the counter and orders a pizza. The girl froze up and I could tell she made the choice to put through his order because she was scared of how he would react if she didn't. Then he came and sat right next to me and said, See, if she didn't want me here, she wouldn't have let me get a pizza. It gets a bit hazy for me here because this is where the trauma happened, but I'm pretty sure I told him he was disgusting. Then he got angry. He stood up, bent forwards towards me and was screaming, 
I haven't done anything wrong. What did I do? I'm a good boy. I've got a good heart. Tell me. Tell me what did I do? How would you feel if someone said stuff like that about you? And it's whack, because even though I saw exactly what he'd been doing, and the effect it had on the teenage girl at the counter, I felt like I was in the wrong for telling him to stop. He was right up close to me now and yelling. He was fully raging out, and I wasn't sure what he was going to do next, so I just kept my eyes locked on his and tried to look like I wasn't afraid of him and anticipate any incoming act of violence. He was just shrieking and screaming. Then the eldest of the workers came out from the kitchen and said, Stop yelling. If you're going to yell, you have to leave. And he did stop yelling. His whole demeanor changed. Now he was kind of jovial and conciliatory. He put his fist out to fist bump me, and he said, You're a good guy, I can tell, or something to that effect. I wouldn't fist bump him, and he sat back down. Now he was just talking at me, blabbering and shit. I wasn't really listening and told him I didn't want to talk to him. The girl he had been targeting was just staring, making these big, freaked out eyes. They fast-tracked his pizza and tried to send him on his way, and out the front, he started talking to this really big guy and was pointing at me through the window. I spoke to the girl and she thanked me profusely, even though I didn't really do anything, I actually felt like I made it worse. She said she gets really freaked out because he comes by when none of the male workers are at the shop. She also said the guy had found her on Facebook and he'd been sending her creepy messages. I told her to make sure her parents knew about this and to tell the police. It turns out the big guy at the front was the owner. The girl had called him and he'd come back to the store. He finished talking to the guy and came back behind the counter. And afterwards, the creeper let out the longest, guttural, and rage-filled scream. I'm guessing his ban had to be re-explained to him. I genuinely worry that maybe the workers weren't taking this guy's behavior and fixation on a teenage girl as the dangerous threat it is. He was unreasonable and irrational and just all round the scariest person I've encountered for a while. He just had this energy to him, this sort of juvenile malignancy. Who knows what he's capable of? I thought it was best to make a police report. This happened back in 2010 when I was 21. My best friend and I had blown off any sort of responsibility for the whole summer and chose to just party instead. It's probably no surprise that by the end of the summer, we were both evicted and now condemned to our parents' houses until we got our shit together again. One night, we were at my mom's place playing Left for Dead until about 2 a.m., when Cam decided to call a cab and head back to his mom's place. He had to use my phone to call the cab company because he forgot to pay his bill. This was also the days before Uber and Lyft, so you'd have to call the station and they'd send a cab. About 15 minutes later, we could see the cab waiting outside and he got in and left. About 10 minutes later, I got a call on my cell phone from the cab company. I knew the number by heart so I knew it was coming from the central station. When I answered, there was a woman on the line whose voice immediately sent shivers through my body. This is Badger Cab calling for Cameron. His cab has arrived. I was confused and responded with something like, Uh, what? She said, Tell Cameron to come outside. The voice was echoey and distant like it was an auditory house of mirrors bouncing around a fog-drenched void. I wasn't sure why the voice was creeping me out so much, so I tried pushing it aside and just told her that he already left like ten minutes ago. I glanced out the window and saw a car idling outside on the street. It was parked a bit to the right of my house, so all I could see were the brake lights. I figured dispatch probably sent an extra cab on accident, 
but the woman responded almost like she didn't hear me the first time. Tell him to come outside, she repeated, but this time with a rigid bite in her tone. He was already picked up, I repeated. There were a few weird noises for a second, like the wind was blowing into the microphone, and then the call dropped. I redialed the number to the cab company, and a man answered. I told him what had just happened, and let him know that they must have sent two cabs on accident. I don't have any female cab drivers out tonight. The dispatcher told me. I thought to myself, maybe it was a guy with a high-pitched voice. The dispatcher told me that the driver picked up my friend just fine a while ago, and that a cab driver wouldn't be calling through their landline like that anyway. When I told him there was a car idling outside, and reiterated that there was 100% a woman calling, telling my friend to come outside and get in her car, he started getting very creeped out and worried. We both figured that someone had to have spoofed the cab company's phone number. It's pretty easy to do, but that didn't leave us with any comfort. Why was someone spoofing a cab company's phone number and waiting outside their customer's pickup location? How did she even know that Cameron had called for a cab? The dispatcher radioed his driver and made sure he had Cameron and that everything was fine. Then he let me know that he was safe and almost to his destination. The dispatcher and I talked on the phone for a couple of minutes, brainstorming what the fuck could possibly be happening. From his perspective, it's almost like someone is following and trying to lure a customer into their car, which is probably not good for business. After Cam made it to his mom's crib, he called me on the landline there to ask what was going on. The only logical explanation he could think of was that it was this stalker he's been dealing with for several years. He had a restraining order on her because she would follow him, break into his apartment, and wait for him to come home. She would do all sorts of weird, creepy shit like that. I'm not totally convinced that's what was happening though. How would she have known he just called for a cab on my phone? How would she have known where I was living with my mom? If he were leaving my actual place or the place of one of our close friends, then that would be plausible. But we were pretty tucked away on the outskirts of town in a suburb, and my mom has a different last name than I do, so she couldn't have googled it. But it's the most logical explanation either of us could come up with, so it's the one I'm betting on. Until someone throws out a better theory. This happened to me when I was 19, which would have been in 2003. I was born and raised in a small town, and I was pretty sheltered throughout my childhood and teenage years. I was always warned about stranger danger, but had never really been in a bad situation before. That is, until this happened. After high school, my best friend Jennifer moved to LA to attend USC. I would say that at this point in my life, I'd never even been to a truly large city before, so when I went to visit her, it was a bit of a culture shock for me, especially things like the subway, bus, and train systems. Everyone seemed to know exactly where they were going, with no help from anyone, and it was overwhelming me. Luckily, I made it to her dorm okay from the airport. I stayed for a week or so, and we had a great visit. Jennifer and I were always together which made navigating public transit fairly easy and comfortable. However, on the day I was headed back to the airport, she had work. I didn't want her to worry, and I felt fairly comfortable after riding the bus and subway throughout the week. I said my goodbyes and managed to get on the train to the airport. The first stretch of my trip to the airport went fine. I think I'd even printed off directions. In case you've never used the LA train system, it travels through a lot of smaller neighborhoods before it hits more recognizable, typical, this way to the airport signs. At some point, I became convinced that I was going the wrong way, that I had no idea where I was, that I was going to miss my plane. Panicking, basically. I got off at the next stop and found the map of transit lines, studying them like they were written in Greek. 
That's when he came up to me. Now when I think about what he looked like, it's a blur. He was big, that I remember, and had a hundred pounds on me easy. But he was a security guard, and he was very friendly, asking me if I needed help. He seemed to genuinely want to help me, and so when he asked if I wanted a ride to the airport, which was very close, he told me, I accepted, grateful to get where I was going. For me, at the time, security guard was as good as a cop. I know now that is not the case, but I implicitly trusted him because of his badge and uniform. The first odd feeling I had was the way he threw my suitcase into his trunk, just tossing it in and slamming the trunk. Then, I got into his car. It was filthy, with cigarette butts and trash strewn throughout. I remember not knowing where to put my feet and had to put them on top of piles of garbage. Still, he had a picture of a little kid dangling from his rearview mirror, and so I thought, okay, it's not a big deal, he's a good person. We start driving, and I have absolutely no idea where he's going, but of course I wouldn't. However, after a while, it's clear he's not going to the airport, or at least not the direct route. I try and stay calm and ask him questions. He asserts that he knows where he's going, that this is the fastest, secret way, stuff like that. We end up in a pretty abandoned business area, a place for freight and other businesses that were either closed or empty. There wasn't a soul in sight, just deserted stretches of road. He begins circling the same streets, retracing where he's already been. At this point, I'm freaking out, but I don't want him to know how scared I am. It's here that I feel like I wake up to the bad position I'm in. He had these reflective sunglasses on and was smoking cigarette after cigarette. After a while of me asking where we were and where we were going, he stops talking altogether refusing to answer me. After a long period of driving in silence, he starts to ask me about my underwear, how long I'd been wearing it, what color it was. At first I played along, trying to be cool, I guess. I made up the color they were, saying that my boyfriend wouldn't like the conversation, stuff like that. I tried to placate him, not wanting to make him angry. Then he told me he would give me a hundred dollars just to see my underwear, and he began to reach over and try to touch me, my knee and thigh. I just told him no, not interested, and he did not stop trying. And at this point, I am fully aware of the danger I'm in. The only thing I wanted was to be able to get out of the car. I began to think of how bad it would hurt with how fast we were going. I began to tell him that if he just wants to drop me off, I can have someone come get me. I remember trying to make him think that none of this was a big deal, that he could just leave me, and that I would be fine. I just wanted to leave the car. I kept trying to remind him that I had a plane to catch, that I was worried I wouldn't make it. Though I imagined that I sounded calm, I know that, in my fear, I was shakily saying everything. It's hard to remember how long we drove around in what felt like the middle of nowhere. I was leaning far into my side of the passenger seat, thinking that I would just have to jump out if it got bad enough. And then, after a final refusal to let him see, touch, or smell my underwear for money, he speeds up and leaves the area we were driving around in. He drives me to the closest train station, quickly, and pulls into the parking lot. Needless to say, I've never been so happy to see a train station. I quickly get out of the car and make sure people can see me. I can remember thinking that was important. He gets out, pulls my luggage out of his trunk, throws it out onto the ground, calls me a bitch and speeds off. I did get to the airport and make my flight. I didn't tell anyone this story for a long time because I felt so stupid.
that I'd put myself into this now so obviously dangerous situation. I still feel this way, but now I worry that I should have told someone that maybe he did this to someone else who didn't get so lucky. This happened to me four years ago in June. Our school exams start around June 20th every year, and well, I chose to not do math the entire year and study hardcore the last month. Our school is a private school that I can't afford without a scholarship, so I had to have good results on those exams. So, I got a tutor, who's also my best friend's mom. I spent almost every day at their place, which is on the other side of our small city. I live in Armenia for context, and we're a poor second world country, so our public transport kinda sucks, and taxis are expensive. I have to take shitty minibuses for 40 minutes every time I go there and come back. Now, until then, my experience with public transport was pretty mild. I'm a girl, which, if you're not an ogre, results in at least a small amount of unnecessary attention, but you get used to it after a while. Nothing too worrying. I got hit on once or twice and stared at a lot, but it doesn't really bother me. I get away most of the time because of my chronic bitch face. I look like the most unapproachable person on earth, let alone the bus or the station. So when this happened, I was beyond shook. That particular day, I had to stay longer than usual. It was four days before the exam and I was extremely panicky. I should also note that I looked like an absolute shit. My hair was greasy and in a bun. I was wearing a huge hoodie and sweatpants. I'm not saying that's a horrible look for everyone, but me in particular. I look like a potato sack with a head, and an onion on said head is hair. So I got out around 8.30pm and it was getting dark. When I got on the bus, it was fully dark and the bus was entirely empty. I was sitting on the first seat next to the window on the left, and as I said, I was the only passenger here. So two stops later, three men got on the bus. This guy, who had the full ability to sit anywhere he wanted, sat next to me. I didn't really give it much thought because, hey, it's the first row seat, maybe he just sat where he could. The other two guys sat in the front next to the driver's seat. We drive for another two stops and a girl gets on. The guy next to me gets up and moves to the seat behind. The girl sits next to me. He started talking to her and she seemed quite uncomfortable, although she giggled along. On the next stop, he moved to the singular seat right next to the window. Now, this is where the first of the red flags start to show. He turns to us full body and continues talking to her. Saying, pretty girl, when you getting off here, maybe with me. And she's saying no and giggling uncomfortably. At this point, the driver himself is side-eyeing this guy. A stop later, she gets up to pay and he touches her thigh. She turns around and yells at him to stop. The driver turns around and calls him a son of a bitch, tells him to sit back and not move until he gets off the bus. Kudos to the driver, honestly. Shit like this is common bus culture. It happened a couple of times to me, and nobody said anything. Regardless, she practically jumped off the bus and sped walked away. My heart was racing at this point. I know it would have been noble of me to protect her, but I honestly couldn't. I was scared of this guy, and I wouldn't have been able to stop him. It's now 9.45, and the streets are emptying. I had my earphones in, but I turned the music off because, fuck, I'm scared of this guy and I'm alone with him, with no one but an old man who's the driver and one of the guys from earlier who's fast asleep. That's where he turns to me. How old are you? I didn't answer and pretended that I didn't hear him. He didn't ask again. I was facing away from him, looking out of the window. Instead... I saw the flash of his camera. I turned around and he was holding his phone to me. He was grinning and looking at me, 
as if I was his friend whom he just pranked or something. I didn't say anything and continued to look out the window. At this point, I was full-on panicking. I opened my bag as casually as I could and mentally screamed at myself. I'd left the pocket knife at my friend's earlier that week and I kept forgetting to take it back, so I took my pencil out and quickly put it in my pocket. Then another flash came. This time with the camera click too. I literally dialed 911 and sat there, and I texted my friend. Then he was typing something. We got to my stop, and I didn't get up for the bus to stop until we were right at it. The second it was about to pass my stop, I basically screamed at the driver to stop. He abruptly stopped and I got off real fast. The guy didn't have enough time to get off after me as the driver drove off as soon as I left, probably because he'd realized what was happening and he didn't want that guy to follow me. I still don't understand why anyone would need a picture of me. I don't even want to, especially not then, like that. A couple of days later, when I was at the bus stop, now heading from my place to my friend's place, I saw that guy again. He tried to talk to me, asked me how old I was again, I promptly told him it was none of his business and walked away. He tried to follow me, but I went to the local pet shop. I never saw him again. I still don't get it, but for fuck's sake, I really, really, never ever want to see that guy again. I'll start by saying that nothing could have prepared me for what I was going to discover the morning after a night out. It started as every other night would. Me and my family got ready to head to our local bar for a fundraising event. i just turned 18 and was looking to have a chill night with friends and family. I knew most of the people there so I was feeling really relaxed. While at the bar, I went to pay for my drink when the bartender told me it had already been paid for. When I went to see who had paid for it, I saw my cousin's partner. He's around 12 years older than me, give or take. I gave him a quick wave and we did the normal niceties like, Hi, how are you doing? It's important to note that I'd barely spoken more than two words to him before, as he was usually quiet, or retreated to his room when we would go and visit my cousin. After saying thank you, I thought nothing of it. Nothing seemed off with our little interaction. By the end of the night, I had gathered my family together and told them I wanted to head home. At this point in time, I was still living at home with my mother. She had made plans to stay at my grandmother's that night, so I was going to go home and sleep. It was around 11.30pm and I was outside having a smoke, about to head to my car. Just as I was about to head to my car, I hear someone call my name so I turned to find my cousin's partner walking towards me. He asked if I was heading home for the night, which I thought was weird. I said it was late, so I was calling it a night. Without skipping a beat, he mentioned the car I drive and said he would see me around sometime. At this point I got a bit creeped out, so I said goodnight and walked off to my car. There were plenty of people outside, so I wasn't concerned at all. Once I got in the car... My phone went off and it was my mother. She was begging and pleading with me to go and stay at my grandmother's house for the night, saying that she had a really bad feeling. Initially, I was really annoyed. I just wanted to go home and go to sleep in my own bed, but she insisted. I couldn't understand why. I was used to being alone at home at night, but she wouldn't let it go. I hung up and started driving home. I couldn't be bothered going to my grandma's when my house was just down the road. I was tired. I just wanted to go home. Not even halfway home, my phone went off so I pulled over to check it. It was my sister asking me to please go stay at my grandma's house. I was pissed off at this point and decided it would be easier going to my grandma's house instead of arguing with my family. When I got to my grandma's house, everyone was asleep. Now I was really pissed off and went straight to sleep. The night was uneventful, 
but I woke up in the morning to my family talking about how they all had a feeling of dread, which is why they didn't want me to go home alone that night. My mother and I left for home at lunch. I felt off as soon as we pulled into the driveway. Once I got to the door, I found a police card wedged into the door to call them ASAP. I went inside and found my mother's camera on the kitchen table. This was a huge red flag as it was in my bedroom before we left for the fundraiser. I went to my room to find my entire room had been ransacked. No other room in our house had been touched. My blankets had been pulled back and it looked like someone had been in my bed. My underwear drawer was wide open and some were also sprawled on the floor. Another camera of my mother's was also on the table where my TV was, which was directly opposite my bed. My clothes were everywhere. By this point, I was losing my shit. If I'd gone home, like the plan all along, I would have made my way through the house and then crawled into bed without switching my lamp on. I had done this so many times previously, and I wouldn't have seen the state of my room at all. My mother gave them a call to find out what happened, and what she told me made the blood drain from my face. The police were alerted to a break-in at our next-door neighbor's house when our neighbors found a man wandering inside their house. The man claimed he was my friend and went into the wrong house, and they chased him out. Our house had a big 8 by 12 meter deck, which looked over my neighbor's house. They called the police again when they spotted the man having a smoke on our deck. The police arrived at our house at 2 a.m., but since I wasn't home, no one answered the door. They noticed the lights were on, so they went inside to investigate. They made their way through the house and found a man hiding in my bedroom in the dark. He couldn't give an answer why he was there or why he was hiding in my room. They had arrested him and taken him to the station and wanted to know if we knew him. It turns out it was my cousin's partner and he'd been hiding in my room for over an hour waiting for me to get home because he knew I would be going home that night. My mother's gut feeling saved me from going home alone that night, and my neighbor's vigilance helped to catch a creep. I always listen now without question whenever she has a bad feeling. Who knows what would have happened? All I know is it wouldn't have been pretty. He was charged with breaking and entering and spent some time in jail before being released and moving country. Always trust your mother's gut feeling, people. It sure saved me from having to deal with that. It has been a while since I last posted a story about a suicide house, but I've had several requests for more stories about my experiences in the field of trauma scene work. If you don't know what that is, I used to lead a crew that would go in after a murder, suicide, unattended death, accidental death, fire death, or any manner of incident that caused damage to a structure that left behind a scene that the victim's family shouldn't have to see. Now I know my stories are not scary in the haunted or serial killer type stories, but the fact is, most people couldn't handle walking into a scene like many of the ones I've been on. We've actually had to be careful how we train crew members who work on such scenes. It was often a volunteer basis for working on those types of scenes, meaning we didn't force anyone to go to a house where the dad killed all the children before blowing his brains out in the lazy boy. We just didn't start someone in training and then go, oh, and by the way, we're going to a multiple homicide. Anyway, if there was a way to describe some of the sights and smells of doing this type of work, I'm sure you would see how truly scary or messed up this all is. First of all, I have to say that suicide is not glamour, nor is it ever over for those around you. If you need help, please get help. Don't let your loved ones find you that way. It not only changes them, but changes the feeling inside the house. Anyway, back to my story. This took place in the late 1990s, just before I got out of the field. We got a call to dispatch a crew out to a house, and we were told that there was an incident with at least one death. 
Sometimes it's given to us that way, but never like a real whole story. But sometimes we saw the true story on the evening news, or even a neighbor that talks too much. We arrive at this house. It's a modest house, but not really a high-end home. It's not quite a low-end one either. It was a two-story home about midway into a cul-de-sac street. As with some scenes, there's a cluster of neighbors outside looking at who we were and why we were there. The sheriff's department had just released the scene, so all of the crime scene investigators had already done their job. As I approached the house, I noticed a ton of what looked like bullet holes in the stucco, broken glass, and a long blood stain on the driveway. We went inside and had to suit up almost immediately, as the police had probably used tear gas. There were blood stains all over. It looked like as if someone had been dragged through the house with blood gushing. There were areas that had pulled up blood. There were areas where it kind of looked like explosions had happened, to which I assumed flashbangs were used, or maybe the guy inside had shot up. What probably strikes you the most in situations like this is how benign the underneath looks. I don't know how to describe it, but just imagine, if you will, a place looking like the inside of a home, molded out of a TV set of Full House. Now imagine the same TV set with blood smeared and pulled, bullet holes and tons of broken glass. I mean, they seem like a very normal family. I remember in their living room a big blue woodcut sign that said, Family. You know, before live laugh love signs were in style, and under that sign were a bunch of family photos of kids, parents, Christmas, graduations and vacations. Other things in the house was a wall dedicated to the dad's love of his sports teams and pictures of him with his buddies at games and stuff. So, what happened? From what we pieced together from the news reports, Neighbors who wanted to talk to us while we were cleaning his blood off the driveway and from the scene itself was that the dad went crazy. He'd been talking about demons. Not like I got my own demons, but actual demons. He was sure that he was being attacked by the devil and that demons were trying to take the souls of his family. So rather than to let the demons take his family, he killed them so they would go to heaven. He ended up barricading himself in the house. It looked like some family members tried to get away after being shot and stabbed. But one collapsed in the kitchen. And one escaped somehow and was pulled out by police. The guy ended up shooting back at the police. And the neighborhood was evacuated for blocks. I can't say that all happened for sure. Due to the fact that we arrived on the scene much later. But that was what the people outside were saying. In the end, he escaped the house and ended up on the roof still shooting at the police. They shot him down and he fell from the roof and that was his blood we were cleaning from the driveway. He murdered his wife. One of his older children later died in the hospital. One of the kids was killed inside the house. One escaped and I think another family member that lived with them was unharmed as they were not at the house when this all went down. It took us a lot longer to clean this scene as there were so many holes and we had to remove almost all of the carpet and soft surfaces due to the tear gas. It was a terrible scene inside. I know this might sound religious or whatever, but come across enough of these scenes and you start to really believe evil does exist. It was April 2020, and we were in the thick of the pandemic. Everything was shut down, and the only human interaction available was social media. I began getting following requests on Instagram more frequently, and chalked this up to boredom from sitting at home all day. I received a request from a guy who appeared to know a close friend of mine, at least from what he told me when he DM'd me. I accepted the request and began answering his messages. We talked about the current climate of the world, what we were watching on Netflix, and that kind of stuff. Nothing abnormal. He had a tendency to send me a lot of DMs at once, which was a bit overwhelming. But again, I chalked it up to the lack of contact from the pandemic. Anyways, 
As time went on, I began to feel like this man was getting a little too intrusive with his messages, mainly with the growing obsession he began to show. He consistently talked about how perfect I was, and that when I posted videos, he felt like I was talking to him and only him. He said my eyes pierced his soul. Naturally, this freaked me out. I asked my friend what his deal was. She told me she had no idea who he was, and that he was just a random follower of hers. So the story he told me about knowing her was fabricated. A year passed by, and he's still sending hundreds of DMs, including voice memos and songs he'd make up about me. He would also regularly talk about how he'd take me shopping and out to eat, when we met in person, even though I'd tell him I didn't want to meet him. At one point, he kept repeating this cryptic message about kissing stars, which I later realized he was referring to a tattoo that I have on my upper right thigh. He was trying to tell me he'd kiss my upper thigh when he got the chance to meet me. I expressed disgust, which aggravated him. He seemed to not like the fact that I was openly repulsed by him, which should have made him go away, but I think he liked the chase of trying to change my mind. I'd block him, but then he'd message me on another social media platform. He was not letting up. I tried being polite, and I tried ignoring him. I tried being rude. Nothing was working. Then, after I posted a short story time with a couple of weird voice memos he'd sent me, he somehow found the post. I did not include any of his information in the video, but he found it somehow, and he sent me my address to tell me to take the video down. I did immediately. He began to ramble about how he would never hurt me, and this was just to grab my attention. It was very creepy. The creepiest of all, though, was when he sent me 101 voice messages describing in disgusting detail how he would stand behind me while whispering in my ear and grace his lips across my neck, and I'd receive his touch. I literally felt sick to my stomach. I didn't listen to all of them because it made me physically ill. Fortunately, since the last time I blocked him, he has not tried to reach out again, at least to my knowledge. I don't understand how someone could become so obsessed, yet never meet in person. In 2010, my hometown was shaken by disappearances. First, there were small children missing, a new report every week. In the same month, a woman disappeared too, and people started speculating that it could be organ trafficking related. Everybody talked about a black Jeep SUV spotted in the days of the disappearances. My mom was working late in the center of the city, so I went to see her one evening. I stayed until about 10 p.m. and decided to walk home despite her pointing out the danger in the city but I was determined to have a walk and assured her it was safe that people were all around the streets at that time. Other than the bus station where I saw a few taxis, there wasn't a living soul in front of me or passing cars. No noise except for the river. And I had to pass a bridge then after about 100 meters on the left of my street, just a couple of minutes walk to my home. As I walked on the bridge, I saw a black SUV jeep parked in front of me on the corner of the street, on the street I had to pass. The second I saw it, the lights went off. I couldn't hear the engine at the distance, but I'm certain they shut the engine off so I wouldn't notice them and walk by. But, without hesitating, I just turned around and continued to walk back fast. When I started to pass the bus station street with the taxis right in front of me, I slowed down to check, and the SUV was driving parallel to my walking. I watched the black glass until it sped off, and I waited for a bit before sprinting home. Maybe a week later, I was on the phone with my boyfriend walking home, and again it wasn't late. As I passed the spot where the SUV was parked previously, I decided to pass my street on the right side 
because there were houses I could easily approach, just in case. As I was passing my street, I heard a car the second I was stepping on the right side, still on the phone with my boyfriend. The car pulled over on the sidewalk. I ran in the front yard of the first house. A man got out of the back door of the car and started approaching me. I was telling my boyfriend what was happening and went closer to the front door of the house. The man started yelling something at me in Albanian dialect and finally got back in the car and they sped off. There were four men in that car. For some backstory before the main part, I smoke weed. I'd smoked for a while, mostly for recreational use, but also partly because I have some insomnia, and it helps with that. The only downside being it made me a bit paranoid, which was never a problem until I switched to vaping my THC. While vaping was much better and easier, I also started to get way more paranoid. Paranoid to the point that I thought there was someone else living in my house, and had even strategically hidden several of my kitchen knives around my place. In case of a break-in, my weed-addled mind concluded. And for those logical people thinking, why didn't you just stop smoking? Well, I was weak and had grown dependent on it. I just couldn't stop. I then had to go buy replacements to use in the actual kitchen because I was high a lot those days, and therefore paranoid a lot, and decided to leave the knives hidden around. I went and bought like four more, and one large chopping style knife, with an orange rubber cover on the blade, which is important for later, because after unpacking my items at home, I had the strangest compulsion, and rather than put the orange knife away, I stuck it into my purse. After a time, the knife became at home at the bottom of my bag. It felt the same as loose receipts, tissues, anything I had in there just adding to the miscellaneous bag junk I never questioned. Now for the really crazy part of the story. One day I had finished my shift at work and had gone outside to get my dose vaping before my short walk home. I then popped in some eye drops and went to grab my stuff, but before I could leave, my manager told me my co-worker had flaked on cleanup and I had to stay to fill in for him and lock up. Needless to say, I wasn't in the right mindset to argue, and it took way longer to clean and lock up than it should have, mostly because my manager flaked on me as well, and I kept getting distracted. When I left, it was pretty late. I was sober, though not much, and made the poor choice of going the 10-15 to 15 minute walk home rather than pay for a ride, and the even worse choice of taking a few vape hits before I set off. That's where the real story starts. The streets were a lot quieter the further I got from work, and the paranoia started to set in. I was glancing around lots, and that's when I noticed him. There was a man on the other side of the street who'd come around the corner. He was in dark clothes with a big jacket and cap on, despite it being dark out. My hackles were already raised at this point, and all my paranoid energy was hyper-focused on him. So when he crossed the street to walk behind me, I was instantly on edge. I couldn't relax with him behind me. I had a terrible feeling, so I crossed over to walk on the other side of the street. Now, you can only imagine my horror when rather than stay on his side, he crossed over with me. My brain immediately pulled a red card on that move. Alarm bells were going off, but I wasn't sure I wasn't imagining things in my semi-high state. So what did I do? I crossed the street again like an idiot and then proceeded to silently lose my shit when he followed me. I panicked, knowing I'd probably given myself away that I knew he was following me. There was no one close to help me. I was alone on a dark street with this creeper who wanted God knows what from me, and I was unarmed. Except you're not, the thought popped into my head. I remembered I'd had that big orange-covered knife in my bag. My bag was wrapped over my shoulder in front of me, so he couldn't really see me open it and shakily rummage around for the knife. I cannot describe the small rush of relief I felt when I had it in my hand, even more so when I took the cover off, and it glinted back at me. When I looked back, 
The man was a lot closer and walking quickly towards me. I froze and stopped walking. He looked spindly as hell and I thought I couldn't outrun him. So instead, I turned around to face him in what was both the stupidest and bravest moment of my life. He seemed surprised by that, but only when he saw the knife in my hand did he stop approaching me. We both just stood there, staring at each other. I couldn't really see his face from the shadow the cap cast on it, so I had no idea what he was thinking. I was a barely composed mess, but I felt the strangest confidence radiating from the big-ass knife in my hand while his hands were empty. It was the same confidence mixed with my high brain and a nagging feeling that made me step forward. I was stiff and terrified, but my body started moving on its own, and I started to walk towards him, staring straight at him. He didn't move an inch, but as I got closer and closer, he finally shifted his weight and slid a foot back. That little movement must have triggered some long-dead predator bullshit instinct in my lizard brain because suddenly my gut screamed at me to rush at him. And so that's what I did. I broke out into a run straight at him and he nearly fell over his feet, turning around. I got so close to him, I could have touched the back of his coat, but instead swiped downwards with a knife that I didn't even remember raising. It slipped across the fabric but snagged on the hem for just a second. It would have fallen out of my hand if not for my death grip. He must have felt it, because in the next second, he was bolting down the pavement like a man truly running for his life, and I, for whatever reason, ran right after him. He very easily outpaced me, but I didn't stop, and when he made the mistake of looking back with what I imagined was a horrified expression, he stumbled slightly, I think he might have rolled his ankle or something, because he was suddenly much slower with an odd run. There was so much adrenaline pouring through me, I didn't feel afraid anymore. I felt so alive, I even felt a sadistic sort of pleasure, watching him scrambling to get away from me. I think I might have laughed out loud. It all came to a stop when my sane brain finally asked me, what will you do if you catch him? Now that thought immediately shut me down and I stopped running after him. I watched as he raced off and disappeared around a bend while I panted. I was bent over, hands on my knees trying to catch my breath, trying to understand what just happened. Was I still so high I just imagined it? Did I just really run after a man with a knife? What would I have done if I'd caught up to him? The adrenaline rush quickly just turned into sheer panic and disbelief. I started shaking like a leaf and realized I was still holding the knife. I threw it into my bag, turned around, and started to run again. I ran until my lungs burned and my whole body ached, and then I just painfully jogged and walked until I finally made it home, locking my door behind me. I dragged myself to the kitchen, pulled water out of the fridge, and collapsed on the cold floor. I was shaking so much. Most of the water ended up on my face, clothes, and all over the place. I may have also cried a bit. After sitting there for God knows how long, my mind running the scene over and over in my head, and all the terrible ways it could have gone wrong, I finally came to a conclusion that I was lucky as fuck to have made it home, and that I was going to stop vaping since I had no damn control over myself. Sure, my paranoia made me notice him sooner and had me prepared with a knife, but it made me an easy target. It could have gone so, so much worse. It was my bad decision making when high that let me think it was a good idea to walk home so late. I eventually got off the floor and went to my room and flushed my vape juice down the toilet. I went back into the kitchen and took the knife out of my purse. It had jostled when I ran and tore up the inside of my bag a bit. I was both relieved and weirdly disappointed it didn't have any blood on it, but I shoved that feeling deep down. I considered throwing it away, but after it saved my life, that just felt cruel. So I put the orange cover on it and left it on the countertop before taking an hour-long shower, crying a ton more, and then crawling into bed. 
So yeah, essentially this is the crazy story about how I quit weed and terrified myself for months afterwards. But now, when I look back, no matter how terrifying it was for me, I can chuckle a bit and hope it was even worse for that creep. I hope the image of me running after him with a knife still scares him to this day. Oh, and I still have the orange kitchen knife in one of my bags. I live in a little suburban area on the outskirts of a city. My apartment is on the ground floor and faces into a cul-de-sac with a car park. Recently, I've been hearing a lot of cat-related kerfuffle from the area. I didn't think much of it at first. There are plenty of cats, pets, and strays in the area. They fight, they screw, all that stuff. I'm well used to the kinds of unearthly noises cats can make. They can be pretty freaky, especially when you wake up in the darkest hours of pre-dawn to them. Anyway, I'd been hearing this one particular cat, I thought, for several days, and it always sounded like it was coming from the car park. I know we, as humans, tend to anthropomorphize these things, but it was a sad little cry. After a while, I started to think that maybe this was a pet that was lost or hurt. Maybe it had been beaten up by one of the big strays in the area. The old heartstrings started to pull every time I heard it, but I couldn't spot the little guy anywhere. I thought about trying to put out some tin fish or something, but there are so many other cats that I had no guarantee that this one would benefit from it. The next time I heard it, I decided to go take a more thorough look. It was about 10 p.m. and it was freezing cold, but out I went into the car park, looking around the bins and checking under cars. The cat stopped crying as soon as I opened the door, but I guess it must have heard a person and clammed up out of fear. I got about halfway across the space, when a street light, right at the center of the cul-de-sac, the only one that lights up the space, went out. Now... That's pretty weird. The street light isn't motion activated or anything. It's time to come on at night and turn off during the day. It stays on all night. I've never seen it randomly turn off before. Alright, weird electrical fault. I turn back to my apartment. Fortunately, the motion activated light above my door that turned on when I stepped out is still aglow so it's not like I've been plunged into total darkness. Except that one turns off too, pretty much as soon as I turn around. Ha, <laughs> what a coincidence of timing, I say to myself, trying to ignore the growing sense of unease. What do I have to be nervous of? I'm standing in a car park in a cul-de-sac, not the middle of the woods or something, but it's surprisingly dark out there without those lights. Fine. I'll just trigger my light again by moving around. And the damn thing wakes me up all the time because it's too sensitive. It picks up cars and people as soon as they enter the cul-de-sac. Except now, it's not working. I wave my arms, move closer. Nothing triggers it. Two weird electrical faults in a row. Not impossible, right? But I can't help but feel creeped out by it. Now the cat, that's been silent since I stepped outside, starts crying again. Except it's not just one cat. The crying is coming from several places at once, and started almost at the same time. There've got to be at least three or four different cats, screaming loud from different parts of the car park. I can't see any of them. It's just their weird alien voices. Enough is enough. I go back into my apartment. I'm not going out to investigate if I hear it again. It's not a paranormal event for sure. Just a series of creepy coincidences. But still, it weirded me out.
For context, I live in the USA, in a pretty well-populated apartment complex, with my building right across the parking lot from the leasing office and the tennis court. About five years ago, the office installed some fencing on the far side of the tennis court to be used as a dog park. On the other side of the dog park is just a big empty field that borders with a different apartment complex, maybe 20 yards away. Okay, so I recently adopted a dog. She's an older pup who alternates between sleeping for hours and being so hyperactive that she spins in circles just to entertain herself. I take her on walks three times a day, and we always go to the park. I adopted a dog pretty recently, so I've been making use of the dog park pretty regularly. She absolutely loves running around the park, so we usually spend about 15 to 20 minutes there before going home. Now, I have an unusual schedule, so our last walk doesn't happen until 2 a.m. This has never been a problem for us, until lockdown happened and my state issued a shelter-in-place order. As a result, the lights that used to illuminate the tennis court and dog park have been shut off. I still took my dog to the park and I brought a flashlight along. One night, we finished our walk and went to the park like usual. My dog had been acting a bit strange, pulling hard on her leash and making grumbling sounds. But once we were in the park, she was running around like normal. However, as I was standing there, huddled in my coat with the hood up because it's cold and a bit rainy, my dog abruptly stopped dead. I figured she saw a rabbit or something in the field, so I turned on the flashlight to look around, and there, in the field, there's a man. He's pretty far off, but clearly walking towards us through the grass. I was a little spooked already because it's 2am, raining and freezing cold, but the man doesn't seem to be wearing a coat or hat. I immediately decide it's time to leave. I went down the length of the park to grab my dog. I hooked on her leash and jogged to the gate to leave. Once we left the park, my dog went ballistic, barking wildly and yanking so hard on her leash that she was choking herself. I turned and could barely make out the silhouette of the man bobbing up and down like he was running after us. I didn't even bother with the leash. I picked up my dog and ran for my building terrified that she'd claw herself over my shoulder to try and get to the man. Once I got home, I bolted the door and wedged a chair under the knob. It was probably a dumb thing to do, but I felt safer knowing it was there. I curled up on the couch in my living room, watching the window and praying no one comes up, while my dog stood still in front of the door growling every time the wind blew or something shifted outside. I told my boyfriend and roommate what happened, but neither of them seemed as spooked about it as I was. I don't know what was up with that guy. I have so many questions about the whole incident, but I'm too scared to consider what might have happened if the guy had been closer to the park when my dog noticed him. Or maybe I'm just paranoid and he was coming over to say hi at 2 a.m. in the freezing rain during a lockdown. Anyway, I'm scared to go out alone at night, so my boyfriend goes with me to walk the dog. We haven't seen the guy since, but I can't shake off the deep sense of unease that crawls up my spine whenever I think back on it. Now, this is something I really want to talk about to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. Now, for context, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to absence of residents. Me and many friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us, so what we did was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I'm about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally, we'd see a small bit of blood-like liquid, and we did see a pentagram on the ground from someone who went to a house previously, but nothing too bad. 
until the last time I'd gone exploring abandoned buildings. Now, when I was younger, I used to go to a daycare that was part mental hospital. Weird combination, I know. It closed down due to lack of patients and lack of children at the daycare. I decided to go back there with my friends a few years ago. For context, I was 15 when this happened. Most of my friends were the same age. When we did get there, it was rather cliché. There was fog, it was rather dark, and there was a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate, which was padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise. We were laughing and giggling the whole time, unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place slash park with flashlights we had on our persons. Even with our somewhat powerful flashlights, our visibility was rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old Legos, wood chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent, until all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt under our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to pick them up, when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door, leading to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I all looked at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five. Most of them were very bold and cocky. We all looked at each other, when my friend Brian suggested we go and look to see where the sound came from. Personally, I was not fond of the idea, but with my group of friends, there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor and we heaved to get it open. As we walked in, the metallic smells and must became stronger, with a hint of something else which I couldn't put my finger on at that moment. We walked in. Our flashlights pointed in every direction with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight, and to the left and right were the occasional metal doorway, some with doors open. I felt slightly claustrophobic, and it felt a little hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is it? I asked him. I thought I saw someone here. It seems all fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety. But looking back, I think he was completely honest. He backed out of the room and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward. When another friend swiftly told us to stop, we came to a halt and all listened. In the distance ahead of us, we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echo through the hallway. We all looked at each other, fear in each of our eyes. Brian continued walking towards the sounds. We considered turning back for a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building, but we couldn't do that to him. The closer we got, the more I felt like I was being watched. When finally we entered a room on the right, which had the smell of rotting meat, in front of us was a dead deer. Its innards were spilled all over the floor, staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and vomited all over the floor. That's when we heard whispering from somewhere. Brian shone his flashlight to the corner of the room, where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green t-shirt stained with what I assume was blood and torn beige pants. He did not have any socks on, and his feet seemed damaged. He was twitching sporadically and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us with a haunting grin that sent shivers down our spine. You guys here for the feast, he said. Each word with varying inflection and energy. This kicked us over the edge and we bolted out of that room, all the way back to the daycare center. 
The door was still open, and we decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all of our strength to close it, and just before we did, I could see the silhouette of the man watching us, his white teeth being the only other human feature I could see. As we sat behind the metal door, catching our breath for a second, all looking at each other for confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door. That's when we decided that it was time to leave. We booked it out of the vicinity completely and ran home. A year after we visited that spot, police went to do a routine search of the area and found the man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psych ward before it closed down. He escaped the facility he was transferred to and lived off of the wildlife around the complex. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of diseases and sicknesses from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. There were rumors that he did kill someone in the forest while searching for food, but nothing has been confirmed. In the end, guys, be careful, especially in dangerous areas such as abandoned buildings. And creepy guy, let's not meet. I used to work in a casino. One night I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried explaining where to go, but she insisted I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned she was a medium, and how her family always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work in a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked how she knew my sister. She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even began to become visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished, as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about someone I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she'd lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again and reminded her I needed to get back to work and to keep walking towards our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked and I began to once again find myself astonished as to not just what she was telling me but also how she would go about it, her body language, expressions, and emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well and turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper-aware of my surroundings. The lights and dings from the electronic games. The mass amounts of people walking by. But everything seemed to be in slow motion. Or almost as if I was leaving my body. It could have been only a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know, but I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and there was weakness in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. 
Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her because I felt the shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and started apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing and she said, If you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, I told her thanks, but I have to get back to work now and quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words and physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was far too scared to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. This encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the co-worker that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden it did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years ago. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly 7 years ago from the moment this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by 7 years, but the person she described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state and company. I don't know what to make of this. I've come here to see everyone else's take on it. I'm open to this kind of stuff, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. I'd love to hear what anyone has to say about it. Growing up, we lived in the projects. Our grandmother lived in the projects area, probably about a mile away from us. My younger brother and I went to take something to her, and then when we were on our way back home, it had started getting dark. We decided to take a shortcut, which meant walking through a dirt road, with a factory on the right and a wooded area on the left. There was almost no light in the area, so imagine an 11 to 12 year old boy and his 9 to 10 year old brother working up the courage to walk through the darkness to get to the main road. We started off walking quickly to make it through there, and I was pretty much holding my breath the entire time, because I didn't want to make noise. I didn't want whatever was out there to hear us. Finally, we made it out of the wooded dirt road and we turned right onto the sidewalk of the main road. We make it about ten feet, and suddenly we hear something behind us. I look back, and my brother does too. We see someone come out of the same dirt road we just come out of. We turn around, my heart pounding, and I say to my brother, They're following us. We need to hurry up. We still had a way to go to get home, and the only street light that we could see was down the road. I say to my brother while holding his hand, Walk faster. We hear the footsteps behind us start picking up speed as we are practically running. Once we notice this, I whisper, We're gonna run. Are you ready? Okay. Ready. Run. And I start running, almost dragging my brother behind me. It's probably all in my head, but I swear I hear the person behind us running too. We run past two cross streets and run up a little hill and make it to the traffic light. We stop and look back quickly. It's so dark, we don't see anything. We still think we're in danger, so we run across the street and have one more street to cross and the project's area would be in front of us. We run the remainder of the way home. We don't want to be told we can't go anywhere again, 
so we don't say anything about being frightened and running all the way home. Thinking back to that time, our imaginations probably got the best of us, or maybe we did escape. We'll never know. I'm so mentally and emotionally drained from this whole situation. Some more important things to know before I get into it. I'm a 24-year-old trans guy who's a homosexual and aromantic, and even though I don't flaunt my sexuality, I don't exactly hide it either. I've made a couple of posts on Facebook stating this, so I don't know how she didn't know. She herself is a 23-year-old woman, and I've known her for almost two years. Anyway, this takes place the day after Valentine's Day, and I'm getting off work at about 3.30ish, when Tiffany asks me if I wanted to get dinner with her at a specific steakhouse that I really like, so I join her at the restaurant, thinking we were just hanging out because I had no reason to believe that a lady I was friends with for two years would want to date an obviously gay man. I ordered chicken strips and water, and she ordered a lot of food. Like a lot. During the whole meal, she tried to share her food with me, and I kept refusing because I just wanted chicken strips. We discussed a few topics and some weird ones. The weird ones were asking about past relationships and experiences with others. I vaguely mentioned that I haven't dated in a few years and usually just end up getting my needs met with a stranger. I kept it vague as we were in a restaurant, and even though I'm open about my experiences with friends, I don't think that sharing explicit details in a public setting is appropriate. I honestly kind of felt uncomfortable as she tried to pry me for details, but I just told her that I didn't feel like this was a good place to talk about stuff like that. She eventually dropped it, once we finish, I went to pull out my card to pay for my meal, and she stopped me, saying that she'd pay for it, and I asked if she was sure. She insisted, so I let her pay because my meal was really cheap. The bill total ended up being almost $100. Like I said, she got a lot of food. I thanked her for the meal and I Ubered home. About 2am on the 16th, two hours before I had to get up for work, I was woken up by a lot of Facebook messages from Tiffany, calling me all sorts of names and other crazy messages from her. I responded half dead with, what? And as soon as I sent a few messages asking what she was talking about, she called me on Facebook Messenger and I answered, still half asleep. She immediately started screaming at me, saying, I paid for your meal. I can't believe you. You let me on. I spent a lot of money on that meal. The least you could do was hook up with me. And some other crazy scream that I was unable to understand. Because screaming at a half-asleep person through a phone doesn't come out as clear as you think. I ended up hanging up because I needed sleep. And maybe she was drunk or had messaged me by mistake. So I fell back asleep. Guys, I honestly thought that I'd never seen a grown woman go so batshit crazy. When I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, I was gifted with a wonderful wall of notifications of 87 Facebook messages and 17 missed Facebook calls. Thank goodness this girl didn't have my actual number. While I was getting ready and waiting to clock in at 6.30 a.m., I read them all, and the amount of horrible and disgusting things this girl had sent was just baffling. She called me everything from homophobic slurs, sexist comments, calling me a dirty half-breed who should have died in the womb along with your mom. I'm of Mexican and Spanish descent, so I think she was referring to that. She said some other extremely disgusting shit. She also demanded I pay her $100 for the trouble. After reading all that, I clocked in for my 8-hour shift immediately regretting reading all of that before. And after getting off, I get home to more horrible messages. I sit down in a Discord call with friends, and I end up dumping the whole thing on them, 
because I was stressed out and extremely cranky. And during that call, I'm thinking about how to go about this when a wonderful idea pops into my head. I should send some screenshots of these to her parents. So I pick through all the messages, making sure to get the best ones to send and send them to her mom and dad. A little bit about her parents. Her parents are the sweetest and kindest people I've met. The mom is a sweet southern Christian woman who's the type to bake cookies for the new neighbors and is very loving in the love thy neighbor no matter what. She knew I was gay and trans but her daughter didn't until later. And her dad is the upfront and clear and take no shit kind of person. The way he talks is kind of annoying, but I like it because he tells you exactly what he thinks. Anyways, her mom messages me a bit later saying, I'm so sorry about this. I had no idea. I can't believe she would say or do something like this. This isn't how we raised her. I hope you don't think we think the same about you. After about ten or so minutes after, Tiffany messages me back saying, Did you just message my mom? And I didn't answer. Some time passes and her dad messages me, apologizing for his daughter's words and acts, and then goes on to say that they've kicked her out of their house, taken away permission to drive their car, refused to pay any more of her college expenses, and her brothers have cut contact with her, one of which is married to a Mexican woman. So you can imagine how he took the half-breed comment she made. After that, it was silence. No messages, no calls, no nothing. Until today, I get on and went to go look at Facebook and notice her Facebook is gone. She's completely deleted it, so it's over. I'm not afraid of her finding me because she doesn't know where I live or work. She doesn't know any of my contact information other than Facebook. This whole situation has been unnecessarily stressful and just terrible. I did ask her parents if they were okay with me talking about it publicly, and luckily they were okay with it. When I was in third grade, there was this girl in my class. She wasn't particularly liked by anyone, as she was quite the bully and overall a rude person, even to adults. She was known to have anger issues and get mad at people for what seemed like no reason. I was no exception. Her name was Carly. She'd been mean to me in the past, but that didn't deter me from going to her house one day after she'd been nice to me all day at school. Naive, I know. So, before leaving school that day, I called my mom to ask if I was allowed to go to Carly's house. She said yes and to call her when I get there so I can give her the address. Now when I think back, I wonder if she had a bad feeling about the situation since she doesn't normally ask for the address and she wasn't picking me up since Carly's house was about two blocks away. When I got there, after calling my mom of course, Carly insisted on making me look pretty, aka wetting my hair and brushing it. I let her. Then she told me to close my eyes and that she was taking me to the living room. I closed my eyes and she began to guide me towards the bathtub. We were already in the bathroom, so the tub was a solid two feet away from where we were standing. I opened my eyes just enough to see where she was guiding me. My foot hit the side of the tub and I said that this didn't feel like the living room. She said that it was and that I just need to step over the gate. I tell her that I know this is the bathtub. She stops trying to get me into the tub and brings me to the kitchen instead. She says she's going to make cereal. I was standing behind her when she reached into her dishwasher and said she was grabbing a spoon. The way that she clarified that she was grabbing a spoon immediately told me what she was really going to grab, and it was for sure not a spoon. I can still remember the feeling of dread that overcame me when she said those words. 
She pulls out a large knife and backs me up into a corner, holding the knife only inches away from my neck. I can't remember if any words were exchanged during this. Maybe I was just too shocked to say anything. I only stayed there for maybe 30 seconds before I pushed her aside and ran towards the door. I grabbed my backpack and put on my winter boots. By the time I had my boots on, Carly was trying to block the sliding door. I pushed past her again and flung open the door. I ran down her patio steps and out her front gate, not bothering to close it. I just wanted to get home to where I was safe. I remember her yelling at me as her dogs escaped through the open gate. I didn't care. One of her neighbors, who was in their front lawn, waved and smiled at me, clearly oblivious to what had just gone down. I ran down the road into my house, not stopping once. It wasn't until I was in the door of my house that I broke down. I began to cry and yell for my mom, my two older sisters yelling at me to shut up. My mom walked over to me and immediately knew there was something wrong. I explained what happened and she was very understanding and freaked out. I can't remember if it was the same day or the next day that I had to talk to a police officer about what happened. He asked me what kind of knife it was and whatnot. I think my mom relayed most of the story to him because I don't remember having to say much. They got in contact with Carly's foster mom and Carly got in big shit for it. At school, Carly yelled at me for getting the cops involved and tried to guilt trip me by saying that her mom threatened to put her back into foster care if she did anything like that again. I told her I didn't care. The school was also notified about the situation and the teachers made sure to keep an extra eye on her, but that didn't mean I wasn't paranoid around her. I made sure to keep my guard up for the rest of the school year, which was true. She had it coming. I always thought that it was a bit extreme to involve the cops, but I ended up making Carly never mess with me again. I ended up moving after that year for unrelated reasons, only to move back before I started sixth grade. The first day of middle school, I was waiting for them to call my name so I know which class is my home room, when I hear an all too familiar name, Carly. I watch as no one goes up to join the class. Was she not here? Next, I was called. I go up to join the class that she would have been in. I found out later, when the teacher was doing attendance, that she'd moved three hours away, just before the beginning of the school year. It's been years since then, and I can only hope I don't see her again. But if I do, I'm not too concerned. And if she does make an appearance, I will make sure that she stays away from me. That incident has given me some trust issues. But at least now, I know how to choose my friends wisely. About five years ago, I worked for a high-end kitchenware company as a floor salesperson. At the time, I was about 20 years old. I'm a female and I'm a larger woman, and I'm five foot nine. I'm also mixed indigenous, so picture thick hair, dark features, wide build, that kind of thing. This is important for later. I'd been working at this job for a few months at this point. My boss whose side note was a total creep, had really warmed up to me and had promoted me to keyholder within a few weeks of working. I'd become comfortable closing on my own and working alone too. Often I'd be working either a full day shift, which is 9.30am to 6.30pm alone, or I'd work a crossover shift where I'd overlap with someone for about an hour. Then I'd close the store alone. That shift was 4pm to 9.30pm. One evening I came in, greeted my boss. He then decided to take a smoke break for about 25 minutes within his last hour of overlap. I didn't mind, as I mentioned. The guy was a total creep. But as he was leaving, I noticed a kind of strangely behaving man pacing outside of our store. 
Our location was inside of a mall, so you'd see window shoppers all the time. But this guy was pacing with intention. He was wearing a large jacket, sunglasses, and a hat, so it was genuinely hard to see him. But he would occasionally lower his glasses to peer into the store. I even called out to him from behind the desk at one point, saying something like, I don't bite, come on in, in a friendly way. He shook his head and said, just looking, in a low but clear sounding voice. He backed away, leaving the storefront. I brushed it off as some random just being too nervous to come into our store. Whatever, it happens all the time. It was at this point my boss returned from his smoke break and began finishing up a couple of his end of day tasks before leaving. I mentioned to him that I accidentally scared off a nervous window shopper. We kind of laughed it off and disregarded it as nothing. But something felt weird. He was pacing for a solid 20 minutes just by the window, staring in. Again though, it's retail. I chalked it up to weirdness. After a few minutes, the phone rang and I picked up. On the other end was a guy with a low and clear voice huffing, asking about getting a gift for his girlfriend. The conversation went like this. Oh, no worries. We have a couple of options for gifts. Is she looking for knives? Dinnerware? I, uh, don't know. <sighs> she liked knives, I guess. Okay. If you're not sure what she already has, you could get her a specialty knife. Fuck. God, yeah. Oh, sorry. Just... Sorry. Specialty knives. I know I should have hung up at this point, but I continued. It's okay, uh... Yeah, so, specialty knives. We have an assortment. Some are meant for meat and fish. Others are for vegetables. Does she like to cook a lot? He proceeded to say some very sexual and derogatory things. Excuse me? I questioned him. He continued on with the extreme comments. At this point, I promptly hung up the phone, shaking and nervously looking around. My boss knew something was up and asked me what was wrong. I told him what had just happened, and he expressed his apologies, but otherwise didn't seem concerned. It clicked in my head suddenly. The guy window shopping earlier had the same voice as the guy on the call. I was petrified. I told my boss I was nearly certain it had been the guy. At that exact moment, my boss got a call from his very young girlfriend, and he had to leave 15 minutes earlier than he had planned. So, there I was, alone in the store, and stuck there for another four and a half hours. The stars were not aligning for me that evening. I ended up calling security and let them know I'd received a threatening call from a customer who I was fairly sure had been wandering them all. They stationed an officer near the store for the remainder of the evening, but I still felt entirely on edge. Every call after that I let go through to voicemail. I was too scared to answer again. I was also working at another store in the mall at the time. I called my friend there to ask if after their closing shift, if I could walk home with them, and he agreed. I quickly walked over to the other store with a security guard nearby and started to walk home with my friend from my other job. The whole time I was scanning my surroundings, getting glimpses of shadowy figures outside and making myself anxious. Eventually I got home, calmed myself down, and tried to get some rest. The next day, I had a shift at my other job with the same friend who walked me home the previous night. At one point in the afternoon, I picked up a phone call, and it was the same guy. I much more quickly realized who it was, and hung up a lot faster this time around, but he got as far as saying, I like this uniform better. I can see more of those curves without. Then I hung up. I told my boss at the game store about what happened, and we made an official buddy system after that. Nobody leaves alone, ever. 
Luckily, we always worked in pairs, but we didn't separate until we were either at the bus stop or at home. Nothing happened after that, thankfully. It was just awful having it happen back to back like that and with no conclusion. The security guard stayed on alert for a while. I ended up speaking to other female workers in the mall, and as it turns out, there was a handful of plus-sized women getting harassing and violent phone calls for a little while, but they never caught the guy doing it. I still think about it years later. I wonder where he is and what he's doing. I never saw him again, I don't think at least, and if I did, I would have known. Anyway, thanks for listening. It feels good finally getting that off of my chest. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revnet. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.